Welcome to the final session of the day. It's a roundtable question slash discussion. Uh, we're trying to deal with your questions uh, based on the various speeches of the day. And um, we also invite uh, the various speakers, if you have a comment on one of the speakers, uh, what they have to say, uh, please feel free to, to jump in. And I need Chris, to, is, Chris is jumping in right now. I need to uh, correct a slight error in the talk. I referred to Cardinal Bertone as if he were Cardinal Bertone in 2000. He did not become Cardinal Bertone until after the election of Pope Benedict when he was elevated to the rank of Secretary of State. Back then, he was the Secretary of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. So I jumped ahead a little bit historically. Uh, my first question is for Dr. Burns. Um, somebody was asking for a clarification regarding organ transplant because they were, they were asking about what about the donation of kidneys or uh, that type of thing. Uh, there, I mean, there is a distinction with vital organ transplant, I understand. Well, um, uh, I hope we made it clear uh, uh, that uh, so far as donation after brain death is concerned, uh, you should say clearly no to that because there is no such thing as brain death. So far as donation after cardiac death or circulatory death, it's the same way. Uh, all of those people are clearly living and you should be saying no to that. Now, when it gets down to donating uh, one of two kidneys, uh, there's a number of people that say yes to that. And I have to tell you that I uh, gave that serious consideration uh, uh, until, uh, and, uh, and then after giving it con uh, serious consideration, I uh, have put together these things. Uh, one is that, that kidney function is at its maximum at about the age of 20. And in everyone, it goes down about 1% per year. So that when we are 70, we have 50% of the kidney function that we had when we were 20. Now, uh, uh, when we I think are, I better drink some water. Uh, when we are... <laughs> <laughs> when we are 70 or older, uh, we act differently than we did when we were 20. The kidney function that we have is okay, but you know, uh, uh, I just went over to the uh, hotel and came back. Well, a few years ago, I would uh, go up those steps, like three steps at a time. Uh, but now, um, uh, thank God, I can go up one step at a time. So, <laughs> so when we uh, get a little bit older, we act differently. So we don't have to have the same kidney function uh, uh, that we had when we were younger. So all of that is built in, and in modern science, uh, and uh, we can do things like measure what we call glomerular filtration rate. We can measure sec uh, circulation to the uh, renal vessels, to the kidneys, and that's how we know these things now about kidney function at its maximum goes down 1% per year. By the time we're 70, it's 50% of what it was when we were 20. It's okay, though. Uh, it's not like we were 20, but nothing's like it was when we were 20, believe me. <laughs> now, if a 20-year-old uh, and a father writes to me and says, Dr. Byrne, I have two sons. One is 20 and has uh, kidney disease and is, uh, has been on dialysis for a year, and his brother is 24. Uh, does not have kidney disease, and his brother is willing to give one of his two kidneys to his younger brother. What should I tell the older brother? And I answered it like this. I said, sir, you should thank God uh, for your two sons. God gave you two sons, one with kidney disease and one without kidney disease. If the son gives away one of his, the older son gives away one of his two kidneys, you will now have two sons with kidney problems. Uh, now, uh, you, you see, I didn't quite answer it directly, but it's like that. Uh, uh, it's also like this, that the, the, uh, it, it's not new to consider the question of mutilation of the body. Uh, certainly in St. Thomas, it's quite clear that they were considering it at that time for a number of reasons 
But the conclusion was that you cannot mutilate the body. And for, for instance, if someone has a diseased appendix, the, uh, the doctor can mutilate, can use surgery to mutilate the body to remove the diseased appendix. Could a doctor who's in training take the normal appendix out of a healthy person? Could a, a healthy person say, take my appendix out, operate on me, cut into me? No, because that's mutilation of the body. Well then, how can you say mutilate the body and take one kidney out and give it to another person? So th th these are things that have to be given uh, uh, consideration. I don't claim to know all the answers to everything. The only thing I can tell you is that, that uh, uh, for me or for advice to one of my uh, uh, family, I would tell them, no, you can't participate. Uh, and, and if someone came to ask me, I would uh, uh, guide them in the direction of no transplantation. Uh, another thing that, that's similar to the kidney is, is uh, donating a, a part of a liver. Well, not too long ago in, in uh, Colorado, there was a, a uh, young man who gave part of his liver to his brother. During the procedure, the young man who gave away part of his liver died during the procedure. And, and then they looked into it and found out that he, he was number five on the list. There had been four previous to him who had died by taking part of the liver. Uh, that's undue risk, I do believe. The recipient, his brother who received part of the liver, died five months later. Now, uh, uh, you, you, you see, uh, the teaching of Pius XII was quite clear that he, and he called it the principle of totality. God gives us our organs, our organs are for ourselves, and his principle was that the organs were not given for anyone else, they're given for ourselves. And God made it so that you cannot transplant an organ. Uh, if, you, uh, if you do, uh, the recipient rejects the organ. So doctors have found a way to counteract nature uh, and to counteract that rejection uh, of the organ. And uh, so uh, um, it just seems to me uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that organ transplantation uh, is the kind of thing that I would have to say no to uh, uh, for myself, my family, and advise that way. My wife was a, 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 a special person, I would say, uh, uh, being uh, married to me for 48 years was a project in itself, uh, but, but uh, she was a very good person. She was very intelligent. Uh, 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 she was a nurse. She uh, was very caring. Uh, and, uh, uh, and she just said, uh, uh, I don't want anybody's organs and I don't want anybody to have mine. Now, and, and I was saying uh, something like, uh, and uh, uh, even a modified answer about one of two kidneys in those years, but then uh, she died in 2005 and so it gave me some more time to think about it. And eventually I came to the conclusion that she was right. And it was easy for her, though. It was more difficult for me to get there. But I think you have to say no to organ transplantation. Uh, this next question goes to Barbara Skernowitz. A clarification, they, uh, someone's saying, would you please clarify the difference between immunization and vaccination? A few of us are still not clear really? on, this, on this distinction. Immunization implies that you have been immunized with the vaccine against um, the particular antigen or viral agent that you're trying to get protected, uh, protection for. That's immunization, implying that that has occurred. Vaccination is just injecting orally uh, or, or by injection, a vaccination. It doesn't mean that you are going to be automatically immunized against that viral agent or toxin. Okay. Is that clear, whoever asked that question? 
This one goes to uh, Chris Ferrara. He says, I understand the logic for your argument and agree regarding the third secret, but I don't understand why they are hiding part of the third secret or why they don't do the consecration. If you had to guess, <laughs> why aren't they doing it? <clears throat> what, what, what is the normal reason people hide things? They don't want them to be discovered because something about what they're hiding would be detrimental to them. The, the accepted explanation for the contents of the third secret, which would account for its being hidden, and here I mean the text that would give the interpretation of the vision, is that in effect by unsealing it, the people who unseal it might well be unsealing a heavenly indictment of themselves. Because obviously, as Cardinal Ratzinger has said, there, we have experienced a continuing process of decay since the council. There has been a collapse of the liturgy, as Cardinal Ratzinger said. As he said, as Pope Benedict in his plenary address to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, in vast areas of the world, the faith is in danger of being extinguished like a flame that is not being fed. Who is responsible for this if not the leadership of the church? And how could Our Lady not have made reference to this when she linked the secret to the year 1960, as she clearly did, despite the best efforts of Cardinal Bertone, then Archbishop Bertone, to deny it. So that's why I think it's being hidden. And the people who are hiding it may not even be villainous in their intention. If you've persuaded yourself that this is just Sister Lucy's fantasy, some invention that she had, uh, an image that impressed itself on the mind of a child, that it's not reliable, that it's not authentic, then you could persuade yourself that you're doing the church a service by hiding this text. It's just some annotations by Sister Lucia, as the Vatican Commentary says, in a footnote explaining why the phrase in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be revealed, is not going to be considered by the Vatican to be part of the, the, the text of the integral message of Fatima. If you persuade yourself that it's not authentic, then you're helping the church out by concealing this text because it's not part of the secret and it would only cause people to panic. So you're serving the good of the church. Now, um, just following up on that, with something that Peter Hornowski said yesterday, uh, does not uh, the entire June 26, 2000 approach and explanation of the secret, does it not tie in with the interpretation of Father Donis? Yeah, that, the, that there is a Fatima I and a Fatima II. Fatima I is the pious parts, which are, of course, essential to the message, prayer, penance, the first Saturdays, communions of reparation, and so forth. But the other part, which makes predictions about the future, Father Donne neatly severed from the Fatima message, calling that Fatima II, the part we don't believe. These are just inventions by Sister Lucia. It can't possibly be the case that Our Lady would have asked for the consecration of Russia, he said, because such a provocation would be unthinkable, and the Mother of God would never request something so unthinkable. So that's, that's the fallacy of the false implicit premise that the consecration is unthinkable. Our Lady would never ask for the unthinkable, therefore Our Lady didn't ask for the consecration. It isn't unthinkable. In fact, it would be doing honor to the Russian people to see that the, through the special solicitude of Our Lady, she wanted this nation and its suffering people to be singled out for this consecration. Someone asked, the second part of that question was why it hasn't been done. The only explanation I can come up with would be there's an influence at work in the Vatican operating on people who may not even know that it's operating upon them, which knows in a kind of preternatural way that Russia can't be mentioned because if Russia is mentioned, it, the consecration, would work. Russia would be converted. There would be a miraculous transformation of the world scene, much in the way that, that Mexico was transformed from a pagan nation indulging in human sacrifice into a Catholic country in the space of seven years. Whether these people know it or not, those who are influencing the Pope, never to mention Russia, in ceremony after ceremony, we're going on the third consecration of the world now. These people know, if only intuitively, and they're being pushed by an influence that knows it as well, that they can't allow Russia to be consecrated because the consecration would succeed. I can't think of any other explanation other than spite. They don't want to lose an argument with Father Gruner. <laughs> Maybe. You think? <laughs> Chris, with, uh, with respect to that, do you think there's anything in the February 14, 2013 address of Pope Benedict to the Roman clergy 
where the, the, the concern about this is, is that Our Lady may very well have identified the Second Vatican Council and the Third Secret. And Benedict looks at that and says, yeah, but that's not what we intended. And essentially that's what he says. The media took this council and went someplace that we never wanted it to go. This, is, this, is, this was, this was a, an artificial council. It's out of our control. Therefore, that changes the whole thing. And so Our Lady is talking about something that the Vatican and that the Pope didn't do. This is what he, I think, is saying. But the media did. And so they're, they're concerned about scandal with respect to what our, which council is Our Lady talking about, the, the authentic one or the media one? Is there any? There's, there's merit to that, that speculation. And we only have speculation in the absence of the text. But as I say, if this test, text is that explosive, you have two choices. Reveal it and condemn everything we've done for the past 50 years, or find a way to convince yourself that this can't be authentic. This is just fantastic. Our Lady couldn't have said this about the leadership of the church. And yet, during that address that you mentioned, the February 14th address to the members of the Roman Curia, at last, the Pope linked to the council, albeit indirectly, referring to a virtual council, what he described as the aftermath of the council. So many disasters, so many calamities, so much suffering, convents empty, seminaries empty, the liturgy banalized, banalizzata, as he said in Italian. When in the history of the Catholic Church have we seen the very liturgy, which is her life's blood, banalized? This is unthinkable. And he is attributing it, in a way, to the council. But he says it's a virtual council. The only problem is the press did not implement the virtual council. Churchmen did. How do you get around that problem? I'm well, sorry, but you can't get around that. Well, problem. there's another point, too, when they talk about that uh, regarding liturgy, is um, there was, uh, during the, the actual writing of the schema, the, producing the schema on the liturgy, you might, this is a famous quote from a, an Anglican uh, bishop, in quotes, an Anglican bishop, John Mormon, and he basically laid out, he said, if the bishops of the council continue on the path that they're on, they will soon invent the Book of Common Prayer, which is now, this is not a media thing. This was the actual council itself. Which is a lot better than the typical translation <laughs> of the Novus Ordo. <laughs> I, I was in a, 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 an Anglican church on a sightseeing tour. Let me tell you about this. I was getting admitted to the South Carolina bar. And I was in South Carolina and, and, I, and went into the, this uh, local tourist attraction, the Anglican Cathedral. And I went up to the communion rail of this tourist attraction. I saw cushions there. I said to the tour guide, do people kneel to receive Holy Communion in this Anglican cathedral? And he said, oh, yeah, we, we make a big deal of communion, not like you Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, when I was in the pews of this tourist attraction cathedral, I took out a book of the common, a book, the book of common prayer and read the mass text. And I said, this is very noble compared to what we have in the average yeah. Catholic parish. That is terrifying. We've, we've actually outdone We've Cranmer and his book of, God, uh, uh, his book of Common yeah. Prayer. We've out Protestantized the Protestants is what we've done. Uh, this next one I think can go to, to Michael Matt, and uh, it's about um, our favorite organization, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, what is being done, or can be, or should be done in defense, it's a two-part question, so I'll give you them both. Uh, what is being done, or can, or should be done in defense of those being accused <clears throat> by organizations like the Southern Poverty Law Center, especially given that they're not interested in engaging in dialogue. That's a nice way of putting it. And why is it that Catholics are so powerless in setting the record straight, as Michael Matt implied? I think what, what's, what's being done, uh, a great example of, as I touched on this morning, a great example of how to handle these people um, who really honestly, although they, they profess to be progressive and liberal and open-minded, are very closed-minded, they're very fascist they're in, the, in the worst sense of that word. Uh, and they're stifling debate. And that's one of the reasons that we're so annoyed with them. We're so tired of them. I mean, they really are trying to shut down any meaningful discourse. So the way to handle them is precisely how our friend uh, Congressman Ron Paul handled them on MSNBC the other day. And we really need to pray tonight that, that Ron Paul shows up here tomorrow. It's 
very, very important. I'm sure he will, although I think we're dealing with the forces of hell, and who knows what may happen to prevent him from being here, because once he walks through those doors, the Southern Poverty Law Center has, is going to have sustained a serious blow, and that's what we need to do. And what the, the other thing I would say with all of us individually, um, do what all the speakers have done this week with respect to Father Gruner. When one of us gets singled out, or when somebody you know to be true, to be Catholic and sound, gets singled out by these organizations, what they want you to do, to, to do is to say, well, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to touch him. I'm not going to quote him. I'm not going to watch his. I'm not going to have any association with him because it's too dangerous. And that's how it works. And that's how the Stalinist uh, policy always did work. It's not here yet. It's in the next county. It's in the next country. It's not, it's not on my doorstep yet. The point is, it's coming to our doorstep. It's coming. It's absolutely going to affect every one of us. Every one of us who are homeschooling or going to a small you know, Catholic uh, traditional mass center or whatever, it's coming. So the thing we can do that's most important, do not be intimidated, do not be bullied, stand with those who've been accused. And now we're standing with some pretty powerful people, I mean, some Protestants, some Catholics, stand with Tony Perkins, stand with Pat Buchanan, even Rush Limbaugh has been, has been accused of this anti-Semitic thing by the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, Lou Dobbs, lots of folks. It's been, in other words, it's becoming a little easier to stand with that group, and at least in this sense, this would be like a, an actual legitimate form of ecumenism, to look at our brothers, pro-lifers around who are not Catholic and being accused this way, and stand with them. So that's what I would say is most important. Don't be bullied, don't be intimidated. There's nothing to it. If we stand together, they become weak. And what was the second part of this question? Um, why are Catholics so powerless? Oh, that's, that's easy. The reason the Catholics are so powerless is because we're self-loathing Catholics. We don't believe in who and what we are anymore. We reject our liturgy. We reject Christendom. We reject the idea of monarchy and things, Catholic monarchy. And then I'm not, I'm not speaking now as a monarchist, but we look at our whole history and we've, we've, begun, we've begun to drink the Enlightenment secularist Kool-Aid with respect to Christendom, that everything was bad, that Christendom was bad, that Catholic kings and queens were bad, that chivalry was bad. And by extension now, the traditional Latin mass was bad. Because people didn't understand Latin. They yeah, and how, how, was the, how was taxation with representation worked out for us? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's just it. They, 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 they really don't have anything to offer, these revolutionaries and these folks that are trying to supplant Christendom and supplant, like we were just discussing with the mass. What have they given us? They've given us a mass that is no longer new. It's, it's by definition passe and antiquated already. No one cares. It's, it's for hippies, and the hippies are fading away. They've given us no culture. You know, the, the, the culture of Christendom is still around. It's still celebrated. You can still find it, and we can, still, we can still give it to our children. The culture that they give us is vapid and empty. Lady Gaga? Lady Gaga is not going to be anywhere in anyone's sight or in anyone's consciousness five, eight, ten years from now. It's going to be gone. So they don't have anything to supplant our culture, our liturgy, or our way of life. So the thing to do is to become proud Catholics again, to look at our own history and understand what we are. Look at our own liturgy. Be proud of it. Share it with people. It's okay for the American Indians to talk about their heritage and about their rituals. You can see it any, any, any time you go to any tourist attraction out west. They're dressed up in their regalia, and they're proud of what they were. That's what we need to do. We need to go back and become proud of what we are, teach it to our children, and therefore become strong against those who would destroy who and what we are and what we believe. I would add to that, too, that um, you know, during uh, after the fall of Rome and when Every, everything had gone dark, as it were. <clears throat> the monasteries, the Benedictine monasteries, were sanctuaries where monks, they lived the faith, they lived the mass, they worked, and they, they established, first of all, a Catholic culture inside their monastery. It started inside the wall. It was, it, Catholic culture came back by being inside the walls of the monastery and I'm not the first person to say this, but this is the type of thing we have to do in our own homes. That each one of our Catholic homes, especially if we have children, should be little sanctuaries. I'm not saying that you have a, you know, have a prayer life and you chant, you walk through the hallways chanting or anything like that. But mm -hmm. I'm saying it's a Catholic sanctuary where the Catholic life is lived in the house. And there's certain things, certain things you have to you know, do away, like throw away the television. You know, I mean, who wants Anthony Weiner in, 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 in your living room? <laughs> who wants Monica Lewinsky in their living room? Oh. And um, so I think this is, uh, this is one of the, the, the great things about homeschooling and the one thing about uh, you know, people holding on to the traditional mass is 
we have to rebuild really almost from nothing. We were starting from nothing and to make sure that our children get the faith. I mean, this, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, this, um, we homeschool and this year I'm, I'm gonna be teaching my daughter Elizabeth a little introductory course in philosophy, into mystic philosophy. I even have a name for it, it's called Aquinas Alive. It's the Aquinas Alive course because Aquinas is not dead the way they want him to be dead. And so um, build up our homes as, when people come to our homes, people should recognize that it's different. There's a little boy who comes around the block that plays with Benedict now and then, and before he was close to us, when he didn't, maybe didn't really knew our names, he called us the Catholic family. Yeah. He called it because he, because we were, because, you know, to be Catholic is to be different. Um, so I don't know if anybody else wants to add to. Uh, I, I want to jump just on a second there because I know you're doing it in your home and we certainly are in ours. This, what John just described, shouldn't have a whole lot to do with saying no. And, and, that's, and that's what we're accused of as tradition-minded Catholics. You're always saying no to your kids. I never say no to my children. I never told my children they can't listen to Pink. For heaven's sakes, it's never come up. And why has it never come up? Because we're having a great time. And that's something that I is so basic to the understanding of what it means to be Catholic. We have the greatest culture in the history of the human race. We have the greatest music. We have the greatest uh, you know, you know, entertainment. We have the greatest plays and poetry and, and literature. It's all right there. And with the internet, you can actually access it in a way that maybe we couldn't have 10, 15 years ago. There's so much fun and, 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 and value to the Catholic way of life. And if it's all about you can't do this, you can't do that, you're going to lose. Your child is going to turn 16, 17 years old and they're gone. You have to have fun. You like movies? Watch decent, wholesome movies, but watch them as a family. Don't have movies for your kids and, and movies for, for yourself. Watch them together. Have a conversation about it. Have some popcorn. Make it fun. And I, I, I know you do this, and I think everybody probably up here has done that, and that's, I think, the secret to yep. having a really, really good time with your children to make sure you can keep them the future. Yeah, the, uh, well, one of the, one of the points... One, you know, oh, sure. one, one of the points I wanted to make, too, is, is in, in uh, informing this, this Catholic culture in our homes, rule number one is you have to have a happy home. Yes. And that's the point you're making. Absolutely. Because yeah. I, 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 was, I was listening to, he's, a, he's actually a, 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 some sort of Nova Soto youth counselor, and he said that um, he, if he's met with many young people who have walked away from the faith. And he said 50% of the young people, of, of say people in their 20s, who walked away from the Catholic faith, when he asked them, why did you leave? 50%, that's a large number, 50% said, because our home life was so unhappy. Mm -hmm. And they equate Catholicism with unhappiness. And nobody wants to be unhappy. Everybody wants to be happy. Mm -hmm. So uh, what Mike was saying is, is uh, you know, the home being a happy place and also a sanctuary for the faith. Mm -hmm. Now we're back to the awful question of vaccines. Um, these are two questions. I can give them to you both, Barbara, at once. Uh, number one, is there any way to get mercury out of your body once consumed, injected? Or, and two, if you want to be a doctor, you need to go to college, but they make vaccinations mandatory. Is there any way out? No, wow. not anymore. Uh, nursing schools are on board midwifery schools are on board. Um, with this new Affordable Care Act, they pretty much have our higher education schools covered with the vaccinations. And as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, they're gonna be documenting and following those, those vaccination records to make sure that you're up to date. Uh, the first part of the question was, uh, oh, mer mercury. mercury uh, key, uh, yes. Um, the process of eliminating mercury from your body is a, a process called chelation. However, I, I want to stress, uh, it's a serious procedure. Um, you really have to have a doctor that specializes in chelating the body from uh, these metals. Uh, it involves first getting a blood panel, finding out it's not just mercury toxicity at this point. I mentioned aluminum. They're finding arsenic, lead, cadmium uh, as a byproduct uh, of, of the vaccination policy. So I would suggest, yes, there is uh, the chelating agents, uh, DMSA, DMPS. However, as I said, you have to be sure that you have someone who is very skilled in the process because uh, as it binds the metal, 
it can attach to other organs when it's trying to, to come out of the body. And uh, so it, it's, it, you have to have someone that really is very professional in chelating. Uh, this next question is for, for Dr. Byrne. Um, could you just go over what you meant about the, the difference between the opt-out card and then the, and as opposed to the type of thing question they're asking you on your license now? Well, first of all, when you go to the license bureau uh, uh, and they ask you the question, do you wish to be an organ donor or one very similar to that, uh, if, if you respond yes, you have given uh, license to the surgeon to kill you, so no one should be saying yes. If you say no, uh, that's not recorded in any state except Utah. Uh, all the other states, when you say no, that gets uh, dis discarded. It goes off in the air someplace, uh, so it's not recorded. The, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act, which has already been passed in 47 of the 50 states, uh, uh, has in it a, um, a, a, a line or two that says that you can refuse to be an organ donor, but they give you no way to record that refusal. They also clearly differentiate between a revocation and a refusal, that if you have already said yes, and then you go back to the license bureau and revoke that, that's called a revocation, but they clearly say a revocation is not a refusal. Uh, and so a refusal is different. Now, it's only attorneys that would get caught into differentiation between words like revocation and refusal. Most ordinary folks would not get caught into that. And I say attorneys, I'm not against attorneys, but, but, I, I, but I do try to understand what's going on. Uh, and so you have to document refusal. There's a way to do it. The, the state does not give you any way it, uh, in any state that I know of. Our opt-out cards, of which I've given all of them away uh, that, I, that I brought, and I brought a lot, but, uh, but not enough. Uh, but you can get that from us at uh, www Life Guardian Foundation and that uh, uh, org, uh, and, and you can write to us and get, we call them opt-out cards. They are not simply uh, opt-out cards, because what they, uh, what they, um, uh, if they would be opt-out cards, and it's uh, these little cards, if they would be simply opt-out cards, it would say, I do not uh, wish to be an organ donor, and that's all it would say. But it's not that. These cards, uh, give directions to the uh, doctors and hospitals that you want to live. You, I wish to live the lifespan given to me by God. I direct my treatments and care, including nutrition and hydration, however administered, be given to protect and preserve my life. That's really the significant thing about the card. Uh, and yes, it goes on, do not hasten my death. Do not do an apnea test. I told you, no one should have an apnea test under any circumstances. Don't let them do it. Do not take any organ for transplantation or any other uh, purpose. Uh, th these sentences are clear, they're concise. Uh, I, I, it's the best way that I know to protect your life, and you have to have these things for your children. Uh, you have to have them for the person who has uh, unable to take care of themselves, someone who has some kind of dementia, or you need them, th th you need them for when they enter a nursing home. Almost all the nursing homes won't take you unless you have a do not resuscitate order. Uh, and I don't know how to get around all those things, but in that other book that I give out, at the back of it are sections about how to have this same language for a dependent person. That's somebody who can't take care of themselves mentally or some child. Uh, so uh, these are the, what we, uh, the label of opt-out card came from the people that I listened to. Uh, 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 and uh, we, before we called them, directions to protect and preserve your life, which is really what they are, but the, the people in the audience have labeled them opt-out cards, so it sounds good to me, too. Hey, Doc, can I, can I just ask you a quick question, and it's, it's a little bit personal, but I'm not trying to pull the liberal 
card of being overly personal. I really do have a real life situation where I have a sister who needs a, a liver transplant. She's just about on the, to the point where she's on the list. Now I've got another sister that wants to, is, is always prepared and made herself available to have her liver taken in part uh, to give to the other sister. So my question to you, maybe it's, I don't know, but my question would be, if greater love than this no man hath and lay down his life for his friend is okay, wouldn't, it be, wouldn't that apply to one sibling who wants to take a little bit of a risk with her own liver in order to give life to her sister? Well, it, it's not a little bit of a risk. Uh, 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 and uh, any, any uh, doctor in this uh, uh, room that's ever been in an operating room when they cut through the liver uh, knows that that's not a little bit of a risk. Uh, and, and yes, with modern technique, they can do a, a lot of things. So that would involve to, uh, a, a partial uh, liver transplant. And I already told you about the, uh, that, that there are at least five recorded deaths from doing that. That's not a little bit of a risk. And then when they do it, they, they, uh, the uh, hepatic artery uh, uh, sorry, the hepatic artery uh, divides into a right and a left, and, and, and uh, so they make the division in accord with that. If the one who uh, gives the liver ends up with 35% or less of the original amount of liver that they have, they are essentially uh, what's been called a liver cri cripple for the rest of their life, and there's no way to predict this uh, completely ahead of time. So. Uh, uh, it it uh, seemed like it would be okay. Now, so far as whole liver transplant is concerned, that can come only from a living person that's been declared brain dead. Now, wh why is it like that? Well, the liver is, a very, uh, uh, is, is not simple to dissect, and to get a liver out for transplantation, uh, it's, uh, it's, it takes about three hours of operation uh, to get the liver out. During that three hours, the heart's beating, there's circulation, there's respiration. Uh, uh, the, the donor has to be uh, paralyzed so to make sure there's no movement, but even though they're paralyzed, when they cut on them, the heart rate goes up and the blood pressure goes up. These are all things that are very similar to what the anesthesiologist sees uh, every day in the operating room if the anesthetic gets a little bit light. Why? Because there's some pain that's involved. The world in which we live uh, focuses on pain more than, uh, uh, than what I always understand. Uh, I don't want people to have pain, but on the other hand, uh, uh, pain is the, uh, is the way that the body heals. Pain is the initiation. It's the thing that makes you draw away. It's the thing that draws, makes things to heal. So pain is there. So in, in uh, uh, so far as whole liver transplant is concerned, it is always taken from a living person with a, 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 a declaration of brain death. And nobody bra called brain dead is dead. None of them are truly dead. Everyone is clearly a living person. So the question is, if you're going to get involved with uh, liver transplant, are you willing to have somebody killed to get a, a, a liver uh, for you? I think the answer to that is no. God gives us our life. Uh, he gives us time on earth. We're supposed to do things that we can to, uh, to take care of ourselves and to live the length of time that God gives us, and we ought not be shortening anybody's life. See, the, the first hour of life is as valuable to us as the last hour of our life on earth. Uh, and and uh, uh, w none of this would count if the person wasn't special. Uh, uh, it, it wouldn't count. What difference does it make if you live another hour or another day or another four hours or four days or four months? What difference does it make uh, uh, if, if you're nothing but a, a beast without an immortal soul, uh, but you're not. You're a person made in the image, and we are persons made in the image and likeness of God, and God gives us our life, and he gives us time, and we have an obligation to take care of that for ourselves. And as a physician, I have an obligation to help you to take care of your life, and I must not kill 
that person, even if they're unconscious and in a coma and it looks like they aren't going to get better or whatever else it is, I can't, I'm not allowed to take that life away from that person. And, and just because the culture and the society uh, 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 is, has accepted it, that doesn't make it the right thing to do. And, and I'm not the only one that, that, that is standing up about this. Uh, that's, a, that's a question I wanted to get to, and that is, it was for both Barbara and for you, uh, are there any medical groups who are both standing up against the, vit the, the organ transplant, especially vital organ transplant, and the problem with vaccine? Are there people coming together Medical well, groups I, that are, I carry a card. I want both of you to answer that. Oh, I'm sorry. But go ahead. I'll let the doctor answer first. Well, and then are there people coming together? Well, I, I would have to say no to that uh, in, the, in the sense that, that there are no groups, but I can tell you uh, that, that there are people all over the country and people all over the world uh, who uh, realize that brain death is not true death. And we've been uh, taking a stand for a number of years, and, and even the proponents of brain death, many of them have switched over and have admitted that brain death is not true death. But we don't have any organization. We really have no money. It's uh, whatever I do and a couple of people that have helped me, but not, not very much. So we do it, um, uh, and, and what we do is, is, uh, is trying to follow Jesus. That's what we do. And, and, and it's okay. If it, I wouldn't be here today if it wouldn't be that somebody else got me here. I didn't get here because I called Father Gruner and said, uh, uh, can I be on your program? Mm -mm. Everything that I do, it's someone else gets it arranged for me, and I'll always hope and pray that it's God and not something, some other way, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and what about you, Barbara? Do, are there, is there... I mean, is there any sort of organization regarding these va the, the vaccines? Oh, many organizations regarding vaccines. Um, against uh, vac I mean, against the dangers of them. Yes. Uh, in fact, there are, uh, I have tons of information. If anybody would like to have that information, I have websites for you, and uh, you can see me after, and I'll be happy to share that information. But in the light of what the doctor has been talking about, I've always carried this card with me at all times. It's a medical card and it's distributed by the U.S. Coalition for Life oh, Randy. and Randy Engel um, yeah. at one of the conferences. It may have been a Catholic Family News Conference. Uh, she distributed these and it needs witnesses. But it's uh, for Roman Catholics. You need two witnesses. You sign, date the card and it says, at admission to hospital, contact a Roman Catholic priest. I wish to live the lifespan given to me by God. I direct my treatment and care, including nutrition and hydration, however administered, be given to protect and preserve my life. Do not hasten my death. Do not take any organ for transplantation or any other purpose. So it's a small card. I carry it uh, with my driver's license, and uh, my family knows <laughs> what to do um, if I go uh, into emergency or as a patient in the hospital. So. I would, I would advise you, I have this contact information if you'd like to have it. Uh, I just will interject, you got that card from me somewhere oh, or another. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> and then to it's put it in perspective, uh, uh, it, when I first uh, uh, put out the cards, I, I had cards for Roman Catholics and had cards uh, uh, for uh, uh, those who were not Catholic, and I, I had three different cards, uh, and they basically uh, said either call the priest or call the minister or call the rabbi, uh, uh, and and uh, and so I had uh, not only had to have them, but so then what I did is over time I combined it, and and uh, uh, and it still says to call the priest. Uh, and uh, and uh, but it doesn't specifically say you can indicate that. But it's the same card. The language hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, it, you know, from after we worked it out a number of years ago, and I, I don't see how the language can change. The same as as you can read it, and the people hear it, the the audience hears it again, and they hear the exact same words. It won't change. And so we have now only one card. May I ask a question? Yeah. Doctor, what do you think about living wills? 
Yeah, living wills, uh, 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 there is no, uh, living wills are like life insurance. That, that uh, uh, if, if someone came to you uh, to, to sell you life insurance and they told you uh, clearly what it is, it has nothing to do with life, it has to do with death, but we're just gonna call it death insurance. Now who's gonna buy it? Uh, and it's like that. Living wills have nothing to do with living. Uh, they only have to do with hastening your death. They only have to do with shortening your life. And no one should have a living will. Uh, they were concocted uh, uh, by people who want to make you become dead sooner. Uh, and, and every state that has a living will law was preceded by a brain death law. First, brain death. And br brain death is is a major lie so far as death is concerned. And then the living wills, they are all major lies also. Should you have something that will, uh, uh, that will designate someone else to speak for you, and that's a power of attorney, and I say, yes, you should. But I say that someone who's gonna speak to you, make sure that they love you and that they wouldn't love to get rid of you. You're not leaving them much. <laughs> and we say that somewhat kiddingly, but I've been through uh, situations. People call me from all over with uh, different things, and I've been th through with things, and uh, one where a sister was uh, n not wanting to spend any more money for, uh, uh, for, uh, um, uh, uh, for the nursing home care for her sister, and somehow or another, the lines got crossed, and I got to the person. And on the phone was suddenly the person who uh, uh, takes care of their finances, and each of the sisters had in, or inherited three quarters of a million dollars from their father, and the one sister didn't want to participate in spending her other sister's money. Now, uh, as far as I know, they were loving sisters, but things change, and so you have to document some, some way. That's called a power of attorney, but Every power of attorney that I have read sets it up that under certain circumstances, they can, the power of attorney can stop treating you and make you become dead. They use words like uh, one that I reviewed recently had the word appropriate in it. It had the word imminent in it. And then it said that, that these could only be in accord to what my agent declared them to be. Well, that's never going to stand up. Uh, and appropriate is one of those, those words that can be stretched in the English language to whatever you want. And then imminent in the law, imminent death has been uh, uh, under certain courts have gone to mean up to a year. You know, not, not like in the next five minutes kind of thing. Now, the, the, what's in our booklet, and I don't have the booklet here, but I've given out lots of them. There are, there is a, uh, at the back of it, is a section for power of attorney to designate someone to speak for you. But that someone can only do what this card says. That someone can protect and preserve your life. That's all they can do. That's all they should do. Uh, and no one who speaks for you should say, okay, it's time to, that you uh, stop uh, living on earth. No, they shouldn't do that. Uh, believe me, there's all kinds of forces to stop treatment for you in our society in which we live. So you need a document that will protect and preserve your life. And all the attorneys that, that are here, I ask you to review what I have there. And, and, and I say I have, I didn't get it there easily. It took lots of work over many years to get it to that point. And, and every attorney that thus far that's reviewed it has said something like, it seems like it will do what you want it to do. But of course, uh, uh, no one ever really knows until some judge uh, interprets whether uh, what it means or something like that. But, but uh, I, I ask all the attorneys to review it and send me any comments uh, one way or the other. Thank you. All right, we have time for one last question. I'm gonna direct this both to Michael Matt and to Chris Ferreira. Um, this is just really flowing from this conversation. And that is one thing that's really evident with what uh, Barbara's talked about today and what Dr. Byrne has talked about today is if we really want really to put it in a nutshell, it's the, it's the breakdown of Christendom. In Christendom, you don't have doctors who are trying to kill you, doctors who are trying to harvest your organs, 
doctors who are trying to fill you up with poison uh, at the behest of wealthy pharmaceutical companies. So in light, um, just uh, Chris and Michael, just in light of the message of Fatima, uh, what, what does this say about the, the breakdown of Christendom and where do we go from here? Well, the, the Fatima message is a call to a restoration of the law of the gospel. The gospel was the law of the land in Western civilization for nearly 14 or 15 centuries before the age of democratic revolution overturned the social order that naturally arises when the law of the gospel is the law of the land. And that social order, which looks at everything from the eternal perspective, naturally organizes all social activity toward its highest end, which is eternal beatitude. Everything we do, every transaction we enter into, uh, every institution we build, every law we pass, every political, social, and economic decision we make, when it is ordered to eternity and the possession of God in beatitude, will naturally produce a society in which all of these things we're fighting against today are unthinkable. So the project of the Enlightenment, which I'll talk about on Thursday, which gave us this conceit of the religiously neutral state, has actually produced an anti-theology of the state that wars against Christendom in every department and has put us into this situation where we're denounced as uh, domestic terrorists who are espousing the law of the gospel as the law of the land. This has been a complete inversion of the proper order of things and uh, the enemies of Christendom have become the rulers of Christendom. Alastair McIntyre said it most famously when he wrote that the barbarians are no longer outside the gates. They have been governing us for quite some time, and our failure to recognize this is what constitutes our predicament. Yeah, I think it's important to, to recognize in, in light of like, the conversation we're having here today, for the most part, uh, what's happening is man's becoming God, if not in his own mind, at least, at least in the minds of, of many people, and ultimately God doesn't exist. We are God. And so the irony is, they can create life, or they're, they're trying to pretend as though they can. They're coming real close, test tube things and petri dishes and all of this. So they can, they, can, they can show their Luciferian signs and wonders in the process of creating or seeming to create life, preserving life, and stopping life. They're taking over the role of God. And we have to look at it from both sides. In other words, I think that they could also, like a friend of mine said, the games that they're playing, ultimately they'll be keeping our heads alive, and some people will call that pro-life. In other words, they're coming up with a technology also to turn us into things that God didn't create, creatures that will go on indefinitely on machines. Yeah, the head transplant. Yeah, so, so yeah, we have really to be nice. careful on both ends. Not only that they might decide to terminate us so that they can harvest our organs, but also that they won't decide to keep us going indefinitely, because that also is part of their game. That's also some of the fun that they're having. And so we recognize that we're going into an age now which moral theology, in a sense, almost has to catch up to because a lot of what we see in our moral theology does not anticipate what we see now happening with science. And I don't think that's, that's, I don't think that's a good thing. I think that, that Satan is teaching, some, like, again, some of his parlor tricks, his signs and wonders, to people who hate God. And he's using science to sort of mock God, at, on the one hand, and also to mimic him to show that we can do the same that he can. So I think, I think it's, really, it's just really important. Where do we go from here? I think it's really important to have conversations and to educate and to study and to find good priests and to really form educated opinions on how we are going into this age of darkness, how we're going to live, what we're going to do, we're going to teach our children, and how we're going to maintain and keep the faith at the same time, aware that we may not be able to go to our parish priest anymore and get all the answers. I'm not even talking about liberal or modernist priests, even good priests on some of these issues, like end of life issues. Very difficult, very complicated. And that just kind of shows you where we were. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's just we have to be aware. We're at, a, we're at a place now that I don't think anybody in the history of the human race has ever been at before. And so we have to recognize the need for education, prayer, and discussion. You know. And this also um, underlines the importance of the fat of a message and the triumph of the Immaculate Heart because on the triumph of the Immaculate Heart will be a restoration of Christendom, will be a restoration of Catholic social order. And so everything we do, uh, we have to do 
everything and every method we can and every legitimate work we can do, but ultimately fi fighting for the Vatican message is fighting for that restoration of order. No, that's right. You can see in, in this, this picture right here, and you've written about this, but I was just in Fatima a few months ago. It's very dramatic what's happening here when you're actually there because there's, it's like a football game. They've got, I think you called, you called the new Paul VI Center a tennis racket or like a, a wedding cake. It's this very ugly building that they put right here now. We were in Fatima right here. It's this hideous building. And then on either side, you've got Paul VI, this hideous bronze statue of Paul VI on one side and John Paul II on the other, and they're literally facing the old shrine. And like I a think standoff. It's, like, it's a standoff. Yeah. And in the middle is Christ, is Christ, the Statue of Christ going like this, and the Lady of Fatima. And you can see this clash. It's literally carved into the stone in Fatima. And I think that's, you know, we've been talking about this all day. Fatima is the heart, the center of this whole thing. It won't go away, and you can actually see it when you go there, this conflict between tradition and novelty. So there we are. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we've, uh, we've run out of time. Dr. Byrne, Mr. Ferrara, Barbara Skernowitz, Michael Matt, thank you. And we'll be back tomorrow morning. Our Lady said to Sister Lucia of Fatima, I promise to assist at the hour of death with all the graces necessary for salvation. All those who on the first Saturday of five consecutive months go to confession, receive Holy Communion, recite five decades of the Rosary, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the mysteries of the Rosary with the intention of making reparation to me.